So this is the second of our two-part series on very basic geostatistics. In this second video, I want to look at some of the insights that geostatistics gives us into parameterization of a groundwater model and how we can use that parameterization to explore parameter and predictive uncertainty. And we finish off the video by looking at some of the more modern realizations of geostatistics and how this attempts to represent what's under the subsurface in somewhat more realistic ways than the theory which we looked at in the previous video. So let's start off with some insights for groundwater model parameterization. So remember in the previous video we talked a lot about conditioning and we spoke about conditioning realizations of hydraulic properties by measurements that we may have of those properties at certain places. But now I'm going to ask the question, can we condition these realizations of hydraulic properties not just by measurements we have of the hydraulic properties, but by measurements that we have of system state, for example, heads in a number of wells. Can we condition hydraulic properties such that when they are run through a groundwater model, not only do these realizations respect the measurements that we've made of those properties, for example, through some pump tests, but Will they allow the model to reproduce the heads that we've measured in wells? Now suddenly things have got a lot more difficult. When we engage in activities such as creeging based on geostatistics, conventional geostatistics that we talked about in the previous slideshow, we assume that the uh, hydraulic property at this point is a linear combination of the hydraulic properties that we've measured at other points. Linearity pervades that theory. However, in this case, the relationship between hydraulic properties and heads, or fluxes at other points if they comprise our measurement data set, or concentrations if we have an advective dispersion contaminant transport model, the relationships between hydraulic properties and field measurable quantities is not linear. However, all is not lost. What we can do is use the same theory and certainly the same concepts that we've been using up until now to do conditioning if we make some approximations. We are make a big approximation by saying that the relationship between model outputs that correspond to field measurements and parameter fields is linear. Now it's obviously not. Earth processes are far more complicated than that. However, by making this assumption a number of times, recalculating, reusing the conditioning equations that we spoke about in the last video on a model that is successively linearized based on parameter fields that are successively updated, we can in an iterative fashion allow model outputs to match field measurements by adjusting parameter fields and when they do match field measurements those parameter fields have been conditioned by those field measurements. So we can do it. And the way to do that, the way I'm going to discuss now is through the methodology is that which is encapsulated in an iterative ensemble smoother. And you can do this by using PEST PPIES, that's a member of the PEST++ suite, downloadable from the USGS GitHub site on which this and other members of the PEST++ suite are available. So just to show the process in pictorial form, here's our 
here's a realization, a geostatistically based realization conditioned maybe on measurements of hydraulic conductivity that we have at certain sites. Maybe we have them, maybe we don't. Either way, we can generate a geostatistical realization of the hydraulic property field, that is, one realization of the vector K. We spoke about K in the preceding video. We run the model on the basis of K. We get a set of model outputs at these blue points. Heads, for example. Heads in wells. And if we have actual head measurements taken in the field, in these same wells, our task then is to condition this parameter field by these measurements. That is, we adjust these parameter sets, these random geostatistically based parameter sets, so that not only are they conditioned by the red measurements of the parameters themselves, but that they're conditioned by the field measurements of system state, and that is achieved by adjusting these such that the fit between model outputs and corresponding field measurements is as small as possible. So let's look at that in a little more detail. Suppose that we have a number of random parameter fields generated, as we talked about in the previous video, just using the same type of geostatistics that we talked about in that video. This gives us a prior probability distribution, a so-called prior probability distribution of the parameters. Why prior? This is a Bayesian term. Prior to conditioning by field measurements of system states and fluxes. So we have a number of realizations of the random vector K. If we were to run the model on all those realizations of the random vector K, we would have a set of model outputs, these corresponding to measurements that we have in the field. Each one of these is linked to each one of these by a model run. And here is our calibration data set. Here is what we've measured. This is a vector of measurements. Each one of them corresponds to these. This is what we've measured. These are outputs, model outputs, corresponding to what we've measured. Well, when we take a measurement in the field, there's always some error associated with that measurement. So if we're using the conditioning process, we need to take into account the fact that any measurement has error associated with it. And some of that error is not really measurement error, it's just an expression of the fact that a model is not perfect. It can never replicate our measurements exactly. So we add random realizations of measurement noise to our calibration data set so that for each one of these we've got a noise enhanced realization of the calibration data set. Then we calculate the difference between one of these and one of these and then another one of these and another one of these. If conditioning was perfect, that difference would be zero. So this then becomes our conditioning measurement. We say, I want to adjust these parameter fields conditioned on the fact that the difference between these and these are pretty much zero. I can't do that till I come up with a linear approximation to the action of the model. That is, I want to express model outputs as a function of parameters that is encapsulated in a matrix. 
That matrix is called the Jacobian or sensitivity matrix. And using some clever mathematics, I can approximate the action of the model based on looking at each one of these outputs and each one of these parameter sets. I can build up an approximate Jacobian matrix. That is, I have linearized the action of the model. Then I have available to me the conditioning equations that we talked about in the previous video, very similar to the equations used for Kriging, and I can adjust these parameter fields to reduce the discrepancy between these and these. I don't eliminate the discrepancy because the model's not linear. So I have to repeat the process. Once I've adjusted these random geostatistically based parameter fields until I get a better fit between model outputs and field data, I then run the model one more time on the basis of each one of these geostatistical parameter fields to produce another set of model outputs, which I match with the field data, condition on the basis that the mismatch approaches zero, and upgrade these again. And if I do that a few times, that's why it's called iterative, I end up with a set of geostatistical realizations of my parameter values throughout the model domain that are conditioned on the measurements that I have, if any, of that same property, hydraulic conductivity in this case, and it can be other properties, storage properties. But they're now conditioned not just on those measurements, if I have them, but also conditioned on the measurements that I have of system state or fluxes that I've taken in the field. What were my samples of the prior probability distribution of parameters has now become samples of the posterior probability distribution of parameters. That is, the conditional probability distribution. The parameters, the random parameter fields, the geostatistically based parameter fields have been adjusted so that they are now conditioned by field measurements. As I said, the maths is almost identical to that used in conventional geostatistically based conditioning. However, because the model is nonlinear, the process has to be repeated a few times until the match between model outputs and field data is not zero, it's not perfect, but commensurate with the noise that accompanies these measurements. Very similar to what we've been talking about so far is the notion of calibration, model calibration. So that is also just a form of conditioning. The concepts and even the mathematics of calibrating a model are very similar to what we talked about in the previous video. However, when we calibrate a model we seek uniqueness. We don't seek randomness. What we seek then is the conditional mean of all the possible parameter fields that could respect geostatistically based heterogeneity but are also conditioned by a calibration data set. In doing so, we seek minimal expression of heterogeneity, only the heterogeneity that is required to fit the data, the expected value of the parameters that are compatible with our field observations. So, this is a picture we saw in the previous slideshow, and we talked about creaging. We said that creaging is a way of interpolating between measurement points, that's measurements of hydraulic conductivity, for example. How can we get a minimum error variance estimate of what is in between those measurement points? And by assuming a linear relationship between what's in between here and the actual measurement points, 
We can indeed use conditioning equations to come up with a smooth parameter field that is smooth by design because it's the mean of all possible realizations that we could have generated, conditioned realizations that we could have generated but didn't, and that endows it with its minimum error variance status. The fact that it's the so-called expected value, that doesn't mean it's right. It means that of all the possibilities of what may exist here, it's in the center of those possibilities. And that's actually very similar to what we do when we calibrate a groundwater model. We don't seek truth, because truth is not ours to know. We seek the expected value of hydraulic properties conditioned by any measurements we may have of those properties at points throughout the model domain and by measurements we have of the state of the system or system fluxes. So the question here then is can we undertake that conditioning process that's equivalent to creaging where we find the expected value of hydraulic properties conditioned not just by measurements of those properties at certain points, if we have them, but also by measurements of heads in wells, concentrations in wells, fluxes at boundaries, so that, in short, the conditioning means that this parameter field fits the data. That's what conditioning gives us. Can we do that? Yes, we can. And once again, the concepts and the mathematics are very similar to what we've been talking about in the previous video and indeed what we just spoke a moment ago about when we're talking about conditioning random parameter fields. Once again, it's based on our ability to linearize the action of the model. That is, we come up with a way of saying that model outputs, which correspond to field measurements, can be calculated from parameters using a linear relationship that's encapsulated in a matrix, the Jacobian matrix. Normally, however, when we calibrate, we go to a little more trouble to get a better Jacobian matrix than we do when we're conditioning random parameter fields using an iterative ensemble smoother. As a result, we get a, a, a parameter field that has a little bit better guarantee that it is indeed of minimized error variance and the, um, and the, and the fits with the calibration data set are often a little bit better. Uh, that Jacobian matrix is often calculated using finite differences or even by the model itself using sensitivity equation or adjoint methods. But Still, what we're doing is the same thing as we've been talking about up to now in the previous video and this. We are conditioning. And by establishing a provisional linear relationship between parameters and model outputs, we can use the same concepts and equations as we've been using all the while up to now. And in doing that, we then end up with a parameter field that fits the data that in this case head measurements that I've have in a variety of wells spread throughout a model domain. The parameter field that I obtain hopefully if I do everything correctly through this conditioning process is the parameter field of minimized error variance. It's not the true parameter field. It's not meant to be the true parameter field. It's meant to be the to represent the minimum amount of heterogeneity required to allow me to fit the calibration data set. When I calibrate, I seek uniqueness. And uniqueness is attained through seeking not a random realization of the heterogeneity that may exist under the ground that's compatible with the calibration data set. It's obtained by seeing seeking the heterogeneity that must exist, the minimum amount of heterogeneity required to fit that data set. Minimum error variance solution to a conditioning problem obtained by seeking the expected value of the hydraulic properties throughout the model domain.
expected in the statistical sense, not because they're right, but because they're in the center of what could be a very wide uh, 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 probability distribution of the parameters at any one point. So when we calibrate a model, we are doing the same things as we've been talking about up until now. We're conditioning, but in this case, seeking uniqueness. In this case, seeking the conditional mean of parameter values. And that word calibration, well, that's used in groundwater modeling culture, but it's not really used uh, in conditioning when, when by, ba by Bayesian mathematicians. They seek expected values. They seek the mean. Calibrate has a kind of a connotations that don't really accord with, um, with the conditioning process. And probably conditioned is the better word to use than calibrated. Calibrated has this sense of reality that comes from its usage in other fields. When we calibrate, we condition. And we seek uniqueness by seeking the conditional mean of the hydraulic property field. So now let's shift our emphasis slightly from concepts uh, to some implementation details. Again, drawing on some of the concepts that were outlined in the previous video. When we use PEST or PEST++ to condition parameters by history matching, we have often have to choose a parameterization device, a parameterization device that can accommodate large numbers of parameters that are then adjusted through the conditioning process. Pilot points are often a suitable parameterization device. These are discussed in other videos. Now, also discussed in other videos is the fact that PEST and PEST++ interact with a model through the model's own input and output files. That is, they have a non-intrusive interface with the model. The model itself is comprised of the simulator plus pre and post processes. The role of the preprocessor is in, if we're using pilot points as a parameterization device, the role of the preprocessor is to undertake um, interpolation from the pilot points to the model grid. So PEST or PEST++ assigns values to pilot points. Then a preprocessor, PLPROC being the one that's supplied with the PEST suite, undertakes the interpolation from the pilot points to the model grid. Now PLPROC uh, provides a number of uh, means through which that interpolation can take place. The one that's most commonly used and probably the best is cridging. Cridging is used for a number of reasons. One important reason is that it's so fast. Because the uh, relationship between the point we interpolate to and the points we interpolate from is linear, we can pre-calculate interpolation factors. They can be stored in a file and reused again and again and again. These factors do not depend on the actual values assigned to the pilot points, the hydraulic conductivity or other property values that we assign to the pilot points. So Kriging, in this case, provides a fast method of interpolation. It's got some other advantages. It's normally a nice looking parameter field and it's a parameter field that respects the values at the points from which interpolation takes place. PLPROC allows interpolation to take place based on two and three dimensional variograms. It's also got some nice features where the range of the variogram used for interpolation can actually vary with pilot point density. Often when we're using uh, when we're using pilot points as a parameterization device, we'll have a lot more points in certain parts of the model domain, those parts normally being the parts of the model domain in which we're most interested and in which we have most data that we can use for conditioning. 
heterogeneity is likely to arise there on a smaller scale. Not because it doesn't exist everywhere on a smaller scale, but we have the ability to estimate it on a smaller scale because of greater data density. Because PLPROC can adjust the range of the variogram that it uses to base Kriging on, the interpolation process is adaptive to the density of the points from which interpolation takes place, and it's more stable and looks better as a result. Now let's look at some of the practicalities of model calibration as implemented by PEST. Remember, calibration is the process of seeking the conditional mean of hydraulic property values throughout a model domain. Now, the mathematical term given to the pursuit of uniqueness is regularization. And when implemented by PEST, regularization attempts to invoke the principles that we've been talking about in this and previous video of seeking a conditional mean for parameters which represent hydraulic properties. The way it does this, even though the concepts are similar to what we've been talking about, the mathematical equations that it uses are slightly different, but actually behind the scenes they're almost the same. The equations are reformulated in a way that makes them more useful for the model calibration process. When PES calibrates a model, it looks for the simplest solution to the inverse problem that gives a model output so that model outputs fit the calibration data set. And simplest is defined actually geostatistically. It looks for the heterogeneity that must exist to explain the calibration data set. It looks for the conditional mean of hydraulic properties. Recall that this is not the true parameter field. We can never get the true hydraulic property field from a history matching process. All we can attain is the conditional mean or realizations of hydraulic properties conditioned by the members of the calibration data set. When we calibrate though we seek uniqueness that is, we seek the conditional mean of hydraulic properties. PEST goes about this by reformulating the inverse problem as a constrained minimization problem. In implementing that constrained minimization process, PEST minimizes an objective function comprised of a measurement objective function and a regularization objective function. PEST tries to minimize departures from a preferred parameter condition encapsulated in this regularization objective function under the constraint that we fit the measurement data set to the level that we'd like and that's set by measurement noise. So this term here, the regularization objective function, expresses departures from a preferred parameter condition. And that preferred parameter condition can come either from expert knowledge, from geological instinct, or it can be more formal than that. It may be, for example, the conditional mean of hydraulic property values interpolated using Kriging from places at which they were measured. And we say to PEST, depart from that preferred parameter set of values or that preferred parameter condition, depart from that preferred condition to the smallest extent required for the model outputs to fit the calibration data set and to the extent that perturbations of the prior conditional mean are required to do that, make those perturbations as small as possible and perturb that parameter field only in ways that are geologically meaningful. 
And that is where geostatistics again comes into play. We can use a variogram or a covariance matrix derived from a variogram to express geologically meaningful. That is, to the extent that departures should occur from the preferred parameter condition, let them be as much as possible, let these departures reflect the covariance structure of reality as we think exists under the ground, as reflected in a variogram or a covariance matrix derived by a variogram. To be specific, the regularization objective function can be calculated using this formula. K0 expresses our initial parameter values, our preferred parameter values. K represents the parameter values that are now departing from the preferred set of parameter values in order to allow model outputs to fit the calibration data set. And at the center of this equation we have a covariance matrix. And that covariance matrix can be derived from a variogram. The penalty that is incurred then through departing from our preferred set of parameter values in order to fit the calibration data set, that penalty will be minimized in accordance with the extent to which those departures reflect parameter the nature of heterogeneity as we think prevails under the ground as expressed by a variogram. So once again, geostatistics is coming to our aid in helping us formulate a conditional mean of parameter values conditioned by the set of head, concentration, flux measurements that comprise a calibration data set. A number of utilities available either through the, with the PEST suite or through the PEST groundwater utility suite allow you to construct this covariance matrix based on a variogram. That variogram can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional or if you want to get a little bit elegant it can have a spatially varying properties. For example, the range can vary in one part of a model domain from that which prevails in another, as can the nature and direction of anisotropy, this perhaps reflecting different orientations of geological structure in different parts of the model domain. Here's an example of what not to do. Here's a model for which the parameterization devices is pilot points. And here it was calibrated using regularization, <coughs> but without a covariance matrix used in the formulation of the regularization objective function. We can see that in broad terms, heterogeneity as it exists within the model domain has been exposed, but there's too many bumps and lumps coinciding with the locations of the pilot points. This is not a pretty sight. Here's a better example where we've got pilot points of varying spatial density spread throughout a model domain. Regularization was implemented using a variogram and the parameter field that arises from the history matching process is much nicer to look at and hopefully uh, is much more, can lay much better claims to be the conditional mean of hydraulic property values, conditioned that is, by members of the calibration data set, in this case being comprised of heads and fluxes spread throughout the model domain. So to finish this short discussion of insights and applications from geostatistics to groundwater modelling, let me just say a few words about uh, upscaling of hydraulic properties for use in a numerical model. Now this is something that we don't pay too much attention to in groundwater modelling, but maybe should. It does occupy a lot of attention in petroleum reservoir modelling. And the problem is this, 
If I'm using a coarse scale, a coarse gridded model that whose size of the grid cells is much greater, particularly in the vertical direction of the nature of geological heterogeneity, the grid scale is much greater than the scale of the heterogeneity that exists within each grid shell cell. What hydraulic property values should I use for the large grid cell given that it represents heterogeneity that occurs of a much smaller scale, on a much smaller scale. And the presumption is that if I use these upscaled hydraulic properties, then I can apply the same partial differential equations to groundwater flow as I could apply in the fine scale and the transition from the fine scale to the coarse scale happens because I use properties that can take the place of the fine scale at the coarse scale. Now one could say is this really possible? Can you upscale and still preserve the same partial differential equations? And the answer is quite unsatisfying actually. Probably not. But what else can we do? Now, there are a number of ways in which we can calculate hydraulic properties for use in a coarse gridded model. There are various averaging techniques for which we can use to accommodate flow in different directions. Arithmetic averaging, harmonic averaging, geometric averaging, other types of averaging, power averaging is sometimes used. But this whole process can be more formalized and made more exact through the use of so-called numerical permeameters. <coughs> so suppose that this is a large grid cell, a grid cell of a coarse scale model. Or it may even encompass many grid cells of a large regional model but where I'm using a coarse scaled parameterization device such as pilot points. Suppose that this though represents one layer of the regional model and that within that layer there is a large amount of lithological geological heterogeneity. How can I determine the equivalent vertical hydraulic conductivity for use in the coarse scaled model and the equivalent horizontal hydraulic conductivity. Well, using the statistics that exists at the fine scale, informed and possibly conditioned by measurements of hydraulic properties at the fine scale, I can generate three dimensional realizations of hydraulic properties. And then I can put them in a, in a box model, a model where I can impress a vertical gradient on this geostatistical realization and a horizontal gradient on that geostatistical realization. In each case, I know the head on either side of the model. I can calculate the flux of water in and out of that model domain. <clears throat> and then I can calculate the average hydraulic conductivity that can represent that large volume in the regional model. Now this has some advantages and disadvantages. It does have an exactness about it that is, doesn't happen if we just use simple averaging techniques. I can generate many different realizations of these fine scale hydraulic properties and in each case I can uh, put them into that numerical permeameter into the box model and calculate an equivalent horizontal and vertical hydraulic conductivity. Thereby I can obtain the stochastic properties of the upscale parameter field. This can then help me do uncertainty analysis when I'm using the upscaled regional model. So this can be a quite a powerful tool. Furthermore, I can use properties in this model 
that are not just uh, multi-Gaussian, I can assume more complicated methods of representing lithological layering, for example, some of which we'll talk about shortly. So I can accommodate much more realistic representations of fine-scale geology and by continuously, well, by generating realizations, <clears throat> putting them into the box model and calculating the equivalent average hydraulic conductivity, I have equipped the regional model, I have given it the properties it needs to to represent hydraulic properties on the scale at which that regional model is used but derived from knowledge that I've been able to gather at a smaller scale. Now this whole thing can and has become very sophisticated once again particularly in the petroleum reservoir modeling industry. Often uh, these, these devices are used to calculate not just average hydraulic properties in each direction, average hydraulic conductivities in each direction, but three-dimensional tensors of hydraulic conductivity. And in fact, if we are going to work in an upscaled environment, three-dimensional tensors of hydraulic conductivity probably have more integrity than assuming that we can have a discrete hydraulic conductivity in each direction. But that's something we don't often do in groundwater modelling. Finally, I should say a few words about the um, problems with traditional geostatistics that we've been talking about and point out some of the ways they've been improved over the years. These traditional geostatistics are sometimes referred to as two-point geostatistics. They get this name because they're built on the basis of a covariance structure in which the correlation between two, any two points depends only on the distance between the points. It doesn't depend on any of the properties of other points in the surrounding area. And this really isn't sophisticated enough to represent geological media with their full integrity. For example, this particular realization of hydraulic properties that we're looking at at the moment, it may indeed show heterogeneity, but it's not realistic heterogeneity. Geological media are often characterized by, by zones or areas where permeability or impermeability is connected over long distances and this is not represented in multi-Gaussian distributions. This connected permeability arises from the way in which geological media were formed. There could be faults that or shear zones that pervade a medium and they can have a huge influence on how water and contaminants in the water move. And if we're looking at the uncertainty of predictions made by a groundwater model, how can we look at uncertainty and be sure we've captured the full range of uncertainty if we don't represent within that media the connected permeability that may facilitate flow of water and contaminants? or connected impermeability that may impede that flow. Another source of connected permeability is river channels. Features in sedimentary environments that may be able to conduct water and contaminants a long way with a fairly small drop in head because they're high permeability and they're connected and these cannot be represented very well at all using multi-Gaussian parameter fields. So over the years some methods have been added to the geostatistical uh, our geost the collection of geostatistical methodologies that allow us to populate models with pictures of the subsurface that are more realistic than the ones we've just seen. I'll mention just a few of these. There is a group of methods that are particularly tuned to representing sedimentary sequences. Some of the people listening to this video may have used T-PROGs, 
but it's not the only method. There are a number of geostatistical methods based, for example, on, on indicator methods. And as I mentioned previously, using methods like this, we normally seek the geostatistical characterization, not of continuous variables like permeability, for example, but of categorical variables like what is the lithology that prevails at a particular point in space. Now we may know that within a particular sedimentary unit there can be clay, mudstone, silt, sand. Each of those is given a number, so that's four numbers. And our task is to generate geologically realistic dispositions of those four numbers. Now to obtain the geostatistics of these dispositions we will often have at our disposal wells that have been logged lithologically, geophysically. So using what may be an abundance of information that is available from wells that are spread throughout a model domain, we can build up the geostatistics of how one lithology transitions to another. I can characterize, for example, that if I have clay at a certain point, then what's likely to be the lithology one meter below that point, two meters below that point, three meters below that point? Empirically, through the borehole information that is available to me, I can build up so-called transition probabilities, and on the basis of these probabilities, shared with horizontal transition probabilities that I also build up empirically, I then have the basis for generating random realizations of lithology, like this. And I can populate a model with detailed representations, stochastic representations, of the, lith the lithologies that may prevail throughout that model domain. These can be conditioned by measurements that I may have in one or a number of wells spread throughout that domain. So each of the many different realizations of lithologies that I can generate can all respect what I've measured, what I've seen in the wells, in the boreholes that exist throughout that model domain. I can then populate a model with these realizations run the model and look at the uncertainty of the prediction that I care about. All of you will be familiar with discrete fraction networks. The same principle holds. If flow of water tends to be along the fraction networks rather than the matrix, we can generate many different realizations of those fraction networks and look at the uncertainty of a prediction of movement of water, or contaminant through that network. A different group of geostatistical methodologies is built around the idea of geobodies. Here I've used a program named Alluvsim, which allows me to generate many different realizations of the type of sedimentary sequences that may emerge from alluvial deposition environment. Channels can be meandering or straight, or anything in between. And I can represent, or a Louvre sim can represent, six different lithologies that we find in these systems. This can be done stochastically so that I can generate many different realizations of alluvial architectures in different types of alluvial deposition environments. Something that is gaining increasing popularity over the last few years is so-called multiple point geostatistics. And the way that, that, that this works is like this. Somehow or other I've generated a quote-unquote realistic picture of the subsurface. Then I will say, and this can be two-dimensional or three-dimensional, then I can say to a program which allows, which, which allows me to do multiple point geostatistics, of which SGEMS is one, 
but there are others that can be quite sophisticated in their implementations of multiple point geostats. I can say to SGEMS or whatever, look at this picture, now give me another hundred or another thousand pictures that have the same character. And, by the way, make sure that you respect the lithologies that I've observed at the locations at which boreholes exist. And then I can populate these categorical realizations that SGEM generates with continuous stochastic realizations of hydraulic conductivity with the geostatistics possibly different within each of the different lithologies that prevail within the model domain. So I can get quite sophisticated in the way that I can generate stochastic realizations of geology and then populate these with stochastic realizations of hydraulic properties with each the geostatistics of each of those properties tailored to the lithology which they populate. Let me just say a few words about the way that uh, multiple point geostatistics operates. Suppose that I've got an image, alluvial system, and that I want to generate other images which have the same character. So this is my so-called training image. And over here we have an emerging image, a stochastic image, which, as I said, has the same character as this one. Suppose that we are at the stage in filling this training image where we have six points. Let's say that the blue is clay and that the red is sand. We've got six points already populated and now we're asking ourselves what is in the seventh point. So to do this we say, let me take these seven points over to the training image and let me go to as many places as I can. So here's our six points that have already been populated and the question is, what happens at the seventh? So I take those seven points to the training image and find any place where I have this same disposition of lithologies in the six points that have already been populated. And I ask, what happens at the seventh? Over here is another place where we have the same points in the same disposition, where we've got the same values in these six already populated cells, and we say, what's in the seventh? And by finding as many points as I can where the same pattern exists in the already populated six points, I can build up a pro an empirical probability distribution based on what I found at all those locations of what might be at the seventh point. Once I've got that empirical probability distribution, I generate a random number sampling from that distribution and accordingly I populate that seventh point. Now I've got seven points and I repeat the process filling other points within this emerging stochastic training image until I have a new image with the same character as the first image. So after that brief scan of modern geostatistical methods, you know, we can we can say that we can indeed populate groundwater models with uh, pictures that look very much like the uh, the real thing as far as geology is concerned. Well, up to a point, nothing looks like the real thing. The real thing is a lot more complicated than we can represent in a computer and will be upscaled. So it's never going to be anything like perfection, what geostatistics gives us. However, we can represent the all-important connected permeability in a semi-realistic way.
Hence, when we populate a model, a groundwater model, with parameter fields generated on the basis of these modern geostatistical methods, they can be conditioned by information that I have available in boreholes and the hydraulic properties that I may have measured at certain points. And though I will have many different realizations of connected permeability, if that's the thing that contributes most to predictive uncertainty, that means I, my representation of the uncertainty of predictions I care about will have integrity. So this is all good. But what I can't do at the moment with present technology is condition those parameter fields with members of a calibration data set. That is with heads, concentrations, fluxes that I may have measured in the past at the site of which is the subject of my model. It can be done up to a point, but the methods we have at our disposal at the moment are quite slow and extremely numerically intensive. So at the moment, we certainly have some powerful geostatistical tools which can represent the all-important connected permeability that may contribute most to the uncertainties of predictions that we care about. Conditioning those realizations by borehole measurements of lithology and hydraulic properties isn't a problem. Conditioning them with histor historical measurements of system states, fluxes and concentrations is a problem. The technology isn't quite there yet. And that brings us to the end of this brief overview of geostatistics, how it can be used in groundwater modelling, how we can learn from geostatistics what history matching can and can't do, and some of the more modern methods available from geostatistics that can, we can use to populate a groundwater model to explore the prior probability distributions of predictions of management interest, but not quite yet the posterior probability distributions of those same predictions. Thanks.